4.2 million gallons a day. On Thursday, the families of the 11 workers killed on the Deepwater Horizon oil rig met with President Obama at the White House. The family members included Keith Jones, the father of 28-year-old engineer Gordon Jones, who died aboard the rig. Keith Jones said he hoped such an accident would never happen again. There are so many different ways that, that oil companies have to make certain that a blowout won't happen. One by one, those protections fell by the wayside. Corners were cut. Decisions were made always, always to save money, therefore to make more money. And should we wait until we make certain that that sort of activity doesn't take place anymore? Sure. Sure we should. Keith Jones, the father of Gordon Jones, who died on the Deepwater Horizon rig, also at the White House on Thursday. Gordon Jones' widow, Michelle, and their two-year-old and four-year-old sons. BP is coming under increasing criticism for how it's handling claims from Gulf residents who've lost jobs or income due to the oil spill, in part because BP has hired the firm ESIS to handle its claim process. ESIS describes the goal of its services as, quote, reducing our clients' lost dollar payouts. The New Orleans-based organization Advocates for Environmental Human Rights says the hiring of ESIS indicates that, quote, BP's goal is to minimize the amount of money it pays to claimants. In other news from the Gulf, the BP oil spill has forced the oldest oil uh, oyster shucking operation in the country to shut down. The P&J Oyster Company has been operating in New Orleans since 1876. Co-owner Al Sinceri said, quote, all the people I buy from are unable to work their grounds unless they open some areas, we're done. In news from Capitol Hill, the Senate's rejected a Republican bill to strip the Environmental Protection Agency of its power to use the Clean Air Act to regulate carbon emissions and greenhouse gas emissions. The legislation was sponsored by Republican Senator Lisa Murkowski of Alaska. Six Democrats voted with the Republicans. Blanche Lincoln and Mark Pryor of Arkansas, Mary Landrew of Louisiana, Bill Ben Nelson of Nebraska, Evan Bayh of Indiana, and Jay Rockefeller of West Virginia. Independent Senator Bernie Sanders joined with the majority of Democrats in opposing the legislation. This resolution really is not about whether EPA or Congress should regulate greenhouse gas emissions. What this resolution is about is whether we go forward in public policy based on science or based on politics. That's really what this resolution is about. The Senate vote came as climate negotiators are meeting in bond to negotiate a new global climate deal. The Guardian newspaper reports the deal being is being written in a way that many wealthy countries may actually be able to increase their carbon emissions by up to 8 percent above 1990 levels if they take advantage of a series of major loopholes in their pledges. The new U.N. climate chief, Christiana Fugueras, has openly admitted the pledges made by wealthy countries are not sufficient to meet the two-degree centigrade pledge made in Copenhagen. The Israeli newspaper Haaretz reports Israel and the United States have agreed on the nature of the Israeli probe into last week's deadly raid on a flotilla of humanitarian aid ships bound for Gaza. The committee is being formed after Israel and the United States rejected calls for an international inquiry into the assault. There will be no official international role in Israel's investigation, except one American and one European will be allowed to observe the proceedings. Meanwhile, video has been posted on the Internet that apparently shows Israeli commandos executing a passenger aboard the Mavi Marmara. In the video, Israeli commandos are seen kicking a passenger while he lies on the deck of the boat. The commandos are then seen firing one and possibly two point-blank shots from above into the victim. The video was first aired on Turkish TV. It's been claimed the video shows the 19-year-old U.S. citizen, Furkan Dogan, being killed, but it has not been possible to verify the identity of the victim. At a meeting of the International Atomic Energy Agency, Arab nations urged Israel on Thursday to join the Global Nonproliferation Treaty and repeated their calls for a nuclear-free Middle East. Israel is the only country in the Middle East with a stockpile of nuclear weapons, but the country has never confirmed nor denied it has nuclear weapons. By shunning the 40-year-old nonproliferation treaty, Israel has not had to reject atomic arms or allow the IAEA to probe all of its nuclear sites. 
Thursday's meeting marked the first time the IAEA's policymaking board tackled the topic of Israel's nuclear arsenal since 1991. Mohammed Mustafa Fauzi is Egypt's ambassador to the IAEA. So what we are discussing here is how to apply the safeguards to every state in the Middle East. This is a precise point that we have to deal with, applying the safeguards. So it's not only that we are asking Israel to join the APT or not. We are asking for the application of the safeguards agreements on all states in the Middle East. The U.S. ambassador to the IAEA defended Israel's stance on nuclear weapons. Has broken no agreements nor failed to fulfill obligations to the agency. Discussion of this item uh, distracts our collective attention from other pressing matters before the board. Premier among those uh, is Iran, which stands in violation of the NPT uh, and IAEA safeguards obligations and of resolutions of the IAEA Board of Governors uh, and the U.N. Security Council. IAEA uh, U.S. Ambassador Glenn Davies. The top U.S. and NATO commander in Afghanistan, General Stanley McChrystal, said Thursday he expects to see violence and casualties rising in the coming months. That our casualties and violence will continue to rise, particularly through the summer months. They could rise well into the fall. But I think it's important because I think it's that pressure we place on the insurgency that, that will be in the security part of this effort important. A federal judge has ruled the continued detention of a Yemeni citizen at Guantanamo is unlawful. The ruling could force the U.S. military to soon release Mohammed Hassan Adaini, who has been held since he was 18 years old. Six years ago, a Pentagon official concluded Adaini could be cleared for release, but he remains locked up. In his ruling, U.S. District Judge Henry H. Kennedy wrote, quote, the evidence before the court shows that holding Odaini in custody at such great cost to him has done nothing to make the United States more secure. The Daily Beast website reports Pentagon investigators have begun searching for Julian Assange, the founder of the whistleblowing website WikiLeaks. Earlier this week, it was revealed the website might be in possession of hundreds of thousands of classified State Department cables. WikiLeaks made international headlines in April when it released a classified U.S. military video showing a U.S. helicopter gunship indiscriminately firing on Iraqi civilians, killing 12 people, including two employees of the News agency. The U.S. military recently arrested Army Specialist Bradley Manning, who may have been responsible for leaking the classified video. Manning's claimed he sent WikiLeaks the video along with 260,000 classified U.S. government documents. Manning, who was based in Iraq, reportedly had special access to cables prepared by diplomats and State Department officials throughout the Middle East. House Majority Whip Jim Clyburn of South Carolina has called for a U.S. attorney investigation into whether the Republican Party or another organization planted three candidates in Tuesday's Democratic primary in South Carolina. In the Senate primary, a previously unknown 32-year-old unemployed veteran named Alvin Green shocked the state by beating a four-term state legislator without raising money or even campaigning. On Thursday, Green was interviewed on the South Carolina station WCSC. What was it like when you first heard the news that uh, you were the you were the nominee? Well, I was um, I was not I wasn't surprised much. I mean, I worked hard. I knew I've earned it, and um, but I'm ready to. What focus. kind of work did you do? Because you know, I've been talking to folks, and nobody's really heard your name. Well, I've worked with my friends and friends of my my friends, and um, we campaigned hard. You know, we worked hard. What kind of campaigning did you do? Okay. Okay. Could, okay. Could, okay. Um, can I end this? Up? Huh? What kind of campaign did we do? Yeah. Okay. We um, we we campaign all across the state. Yes. Less than 24 hours after Alvin Green won the primary, the state Democratic Party in South Carolina asked him to withdraw from the race because of a pending felony charge. 
The city of New York has reached a new settlement with around 10,000 rescue and cleanup workers who were exposed to dangerous toxic chemicals at the World Trade Center site following the 9-11 attacks. Under the deal, the city will pay out up to $712 million. Individual workers must decide now whether to accept the settlement or wait for a federal bill that could reopen the 9-11 Victim Compensation Fund to cleanup workers who got sick. Here in New York, a group of students staged a die-in in front of Senator Chuck Schumer's office Thursday. The students called on Schumer to support the DREAM Act, which would grant the children of undocumented immigrants a path to legal status. The die-in occurred after the students ended a 10-day hunger strike. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. And welcome to all of our